diligent giving of donations. And we just want to say thank you. Um, uh, So just join with me for a moment in prayer as we just thank God for his provision for us. Lord Jesus, we just thank you for all your provision in our lives today. We thank you uh, for the breath in our lungs. We thank you for our bodies. We thank you for our jobs and our homes. We thank you for church. We thank you for our friends. Uh, We thank you for the opportunities that you have given us. We thank you for having a hope and a future in you. And Lord, we thank you that we know that at the end of our earthly lives, we'll get to be with you in heaven. We thank you for all of that giving that you have bestowed upon us. And we say thank you from the bottom of our hearts as we return our our financial giving back to you, Lord God. We pray all these things uh, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, We're going to be commencing a a brand new series uh, today, uh, all on the miracles of Jesus. And uh, I was praying kind of between Christmas and the New Year uh, break uh, just about what to be bringing as the next season, the next series. Um, And I felt the Lord quite distinctly say, hey, Nick, talk about my miracles. And I'm like, great, Jesus, let's do that. Um, And it's kind of a nice, clear instruction. So over the next kind of few weeks or so, we're going to be hearing about different miracles that Jesus performed uh, in his ministry and the kind of impact they had on people's lives and what they say about Jesus and the kingdom of heaven um, and, and the kind of effect he was hoping to bring about by performing the different miracles that we see in the Gospels. Um, so I'm going to open my message today with a story. Uh, this is a story which is from the Manchester Evening News from the 24th of August just last year, so just a few months back. This is how the story reads. A distraught mum has revealed the heartbreaking last words her dying son made and her vow to look after his two children. Connor Pleasance, age 26, was taken into hospital after starting to feel ill in June. He was diagnosed with a ruptured bladder. While in hospital, he also caught pneumonia Connor was eventually able to return back to his home to Barnsley, South Yorkshire, but he fell ill again soon after. (coughs) Described by his mum as young and fit, Connor was placed in a coma after complications caused by the ruptured bladder. He died in the early hours of Sunday, August the 14th, after spending three weeks on life support. Mum, Joe Pleasance, aged 48, shared news of Connor's passing in a touching tribute on social media, reports Yorkshire Live. In the post, Joe wrote, can't believe I'm writing this, but I am. My beautiful, amazing boy lost his fight last night. I'm truly heartbroken. I'm gonna miss you so much, son. You are everything to me and always will be. Love you forever, my angel. An appeal set up to support the family after he was placed on life support has raised nearly 6,000. And yesterday, this is going back to August the 23rd last year, uh, Joe said, he's my only child and I've lost him. It's been an awful time. It just happened so suddenly. He was fun-loving and clever, worked as a team leader at a call center, and he loved his kids. His last words uh, to me were, look after my kids, mum. I love you. And I told him I loved him and promised that I would do. He has two little ones, five-year-old Grace and his boy Bo, who is just four months old. He only met Bo for three weeks because of him being in hospital so much. I must say thank you to the staff at the hospital in Leicester. They were absolutely brilliant looking after him, and I have been overwhelmed by the response to his plight. (coughs) Everyone has been so kind, um, and the folks at the Bull's Head pub in Brampton, our local, have been great. uh, He was a very popular lad and a gamer. So he has had messages of support from all over the world. I expect there will be a lot of people at his funeral service. Now, when you read a story like that uh, in the newspaper, your heart really does break for such a tragedy. That's a young family without a dad anymore. Uh, And that mum, Jo, Jo Pleasance, she's lost her only son. People are fragile. And they can be so easily lost to us, just like that. And I think when we hear a story like that, we really agonize internally over it, don't we? Because uh, we ask ourselves, how could someone in the prime of life, you know, in the prime of their lives, be lost in that way? Now, I'm sure there are many, many of us in this room and online who can identify with the shock of losing someone suddenly and in really sad circumstances. I'm sure that that's an experience that many of us have been through. 
But perhaps there is something extra painful about someone's son or daughter passing away before their parents do. I think some of that is to do with the fact that we all grow up with this expectation, don't we, that um, if things kind of should go to the normal pattern and plan, then our parents are probably going to pass away before we do. I mean, that's kind of what we all grow up thinking, isn't it? Um, And when we become parents ourselves, we hope and pray that we are greatly outlasted by our kids and that they go on to have a really long life after we've gone. Now, when that doesn't happen and a child dies before a parent, it breaks that expectation very profoundly and it seems to cut all the more deeply. Now, you may or may not know this, but in 1970s China, they introduced a policy of one child per family to to slow down the colossal population growth that they were experiencing in their nation. And that's, that's a policy that ended in 2016, but I think whatever you think of that or make of that policy, the consequences of, of that action uh, by the Chinese government is going to be felt for a long time. Now, there's a college in New York City, right in the heart of Manhattan, called the, Roy, the, the Rory Myers College of Nursing, and it's part of the city of New York University. And they partnered with this university in Shanghai called Fudan University uh, over in China. And they did this study, and it's back in 2013 that they, they did this study, and it looked at the effects of... Uh, when a parent loses a child. And the study identified two things. Um, And the two things, the first one of these two things you will, are going to expect. Um, And the the first is this. The death of a child has been recognized as one of the most challenging and traumatic events for a parent. And, And in a sense, we would all expect that, wouldn't we? Because it is. But what we might find a bit more surprising is the second thing that they found, which is maybe slightly more relevant to China, as I'll explain in just a moment. They found that the loss of an only child is apparently even more challenging than the loss of a husband or a wife in that family situation. And you can understand that for Chinese society, can't you? Because it spent nearly five decades urging and putting legislation around couples only having one child. And so if a single child that a family has is lost unexpected, unexpectedly early, then parents there or in that situation are going to find that ever so difficult. So the reason I open with that story and that information about single child families is that we're starting a new series today on miracles, and the miracle that we're opening with hits just this particular issue. Now, my hope out of this series is that we're going to learn something of the character and the nature of Jesus uh, through the miracles he performed. And and I'd love us to experience something of the presence and the nearness of the kingdom of God for ourselves as we explore some of the miraculous occasions that he takes people through uh, and that took place during his ministry. Um, In fact, I'm going to pray uh, over this series, and I'm going to pray now, actually, that there would be some miracles that occur during this series over the next few weeks that are just awesome because God can do whatever he wants to do as Sheila reminded us during worship can't he Jesus can do absolutely anything he wants to do and and I think we've maybe lost sight a little bit of the power that Jesus has to be able to do absolutely anything he likes God is all powerful there is nothing impossible for the Lord Would you just pray with me just a moment? Lord Jesus, I ask over these next few weeks and starting even today that you would do some absolutely outrageous and stunning miracles in our our church. In amongst us, here in the building, online, around the city, would you do some amazing, amazing things, Lord Jesus? Would you send your spirit in strong measure? Would there be some truly spectacular stuff that you unleash over these next few weeks because it brings glory to your name, Lord Jesus? just because you can. We love you, Lord Jesus, and we love it when you do these things. Would you bring glory to your name, we pray, in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said amen. So we're opening the series with this stunning miracle performed by Jesus in a town called Nain. Now, not only did Jesus perform a resurrection from the dead, he did it for this woman who is in a similar category to Joe from that news story from the Manchester Evening News article. Now, the widow of Nain was similar to Joe. She had just one son, and she lost him. Um, Now, the Bible doesn't tell us what this this lad or this young man died of, but clearly he has died way too early 
and much sooner than he should have done. Now, we also find out from Luke's story, um, almost to add insult to injury, that not only has this poor woman gone through possibly the most acute emotional pain uh, that a parent can ever go through, she is also a widow herself. She has lost her husband. And so Luke is trying to show us a person who has been through the very, very worst and most brutal emotional scenario you can imagine. Imagine getting married, having a son, and having everything to look forward to, and the future all mapped out, and then the husband dies, and then the son dies. That is devastating. So this is a person who has been through the toughest stuff ever. Just really, really difficult. Um, Please pick up the story with me from Luke chapter 7, from verses 11 to 17. Um, We're going to read this from the message translation. Eugene Peterson has done such a great job of this translation. I like the Christian Standard Version of the Bible, and I quite often use that as a default, but the message just absolutely hits this story on the head. He gets the vibe of it so, so good. Uh, it's, It's great. If you want to jump into the YouVersion app, uh, if you look for Birmingham City Church under events, you will find the event there. Um, I had this idea on the way to church, but it was at about 20 to 9. It would be great to have the QR code up on the graphic there all the way through the message. That'd be good, wouldn't it, Sheila? We could do that. But at 20 to 9, I'm not going to get my sort of Photoshop out and do that. Uh, That was just the wrong timing from the Lord. So we need to work on that, Lord. Just give me that idea like, you know, in the week. Uh, So... So journey with me through this. You can add your own notes to this. Uh, We've got the scripture references there uh, and so on. Right, Luke 7 from verse 11. Not long after that, Jesus went to the village of Nain. His disciples were with him, along with quite a large crowd. As they approached the village gate, they met a funeral procession. A woman's only son was being carried out for burial. And the mother was a widow. When Jesus saw her, his heart broke. He said to her, don't cry. Then he went over and touched the coffin. The pallbearers stopped. He said, young man, I tell you, get up. The dead man, sorry, the dead son sat up and began talking. Jesus presented him to his mother. (coughs) They all realized they were in a place of holy mystery, that God was at work among them. They were quietly worshipful and then noisily grateful, calling out among themselves, God is back, looking to the needs of his people. The news of Jesus spread all through the country. So before we get into making some observations on this particular story, I think it's probably worth just defining what a miracle is, given that we're about to spend a few weeks uh, looking at them and trying to understand them. Um, A miracle is an unusual and mysterious event that is thought to have been caused by God because it does not follow the usual laws of nature. A miracle is an unusual and mysterious event that is is thought to have been caused by God because it does not follow the usual laws of nature. Now, in this instance, a young man has died, and everyone in this village of Nain knows that he is definitely dead, and they are all accompanying his mum in being about to go out and bury him. And in the vast majority of cases, when someone dies, the natural order of things says, that's it, game over. This person's life is now finished. That's what, we, that's what we kind of understand, isn't it? Now, this is a miracle because Jesus comes along and he speaks to the corpse. Young man, I tell you, get up, he says. He speaks words to the, cor- uh, to the corpse, to the dead body, and as he speaks, resurrection power floods the man's body And he sits up and starts to talk. That is not normal. That is absolutely a miracle right there. That is a God-ordained, powerful miracle from heaven through Jesus to that man's body. And he suddenly wakes up and comes back to life. And the crowd know it too. They get it straight away because they respond in an amazing way. And they realize that they're in a place of holy mystery. They realize that something absolutely outrageous has happened right in front of their faces. And they're like, whoa, God, you're at work. You have done something here. Now, in this day and age, we've become a little bit used to the idea of the miraculous when we read through the Gospels. But I just want to remind us that this is a stunning and sensational event. This is highly, highly unusual. This man got to sit at his mum's dinner table that night. 
having been dead that morning. That is pretty weird. He would have been a minor celebrity, maybe even a major celebrity, in name for the rest of his life. People would have constantly gone up to him and asked him, what was it like being dead? I would. I'd go and ask him. Was it black? Were there lights? Was there a voice calling you to a nice place? I don't know. And then he could have said and told them. I'm betting he had some friends who teased him about what he first said when he first sat up on the beer. You know, on the, you know, he would have sat up and said something because the story says that's the, you know, that's the first thing that happened. And I bet his mate said, oh, yeah, you, you didn't say thanks to Jesus, did you? You just sat up and started talking about something else. I don't know. Luke is kind. He hides that from us. Have you noticed? It's not recorded. A mum no longer faced her future without her son. She no longer faced destitution. Perhaps this man went on to get married and have kids. They would be miracle kids right there, wouldn't they? Now, all kids are miracles, really, if we just rewind a moment. But his kids would be pretty miraculous because they wouldn't have existed unless Jesus had done his thing. In fact, any generations following on after this man would not be there if Jesus had not stepped in. The miracles of Jesus change history for people he does the miracles for. Amen? Let me bring you three observations about miracles from this absolute gem of a story from Luke 7. Um, and I want to use these, these three points as a means of kind of launching this series on miracles for us all. Number one, miracles reveal how God really wants things to be. Miracles reveal how God really wants things to be. Not the, the, the grotty reality that we will have to face, but a different reality that comes straight from the kingdom of heaven. I, I was pondering why I find this miracle so appealing, and it's because God uh, causes some things to travel in a different direction than they had been traveling before the miracle took place. And that change of direction or trajectory itself reveals something of God's heart for people and for situations. And the first and the most obvious thing, the elephant in the room, if we like, is to say that God is all about life and not about death. He's all about life. So Jesus brings divine power near to someone who has passed away, and suddenly they come back to life. And that tells me if we draw near to the kingdom of God, or it draws near to us, we will all find life bursting out all over the place all around us and in us. We will find death-defying life sprouting up everywhere the kingdom of God hovers close. We see it here. We see it in the other miracles of, in the, both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And we see it modeled directly in Jesus' own life, of course, because he rose again uh, on the third day after the, going to the cross. There are a few more changes of direction in this miracle which reveal God's heart, we see that compassion features very highly in the motivation that Jesus shows to sort this poor woman's situation out, having lost both her husband and her son. Um, I looked into the language behind this in the Greek, and there's a, there's a word in, uh, where it talks about how he approaches where the, where the body is laid. And, and, and that word approach, uh, the way it's set up in Luke 7 is it, it's the only instance, it, it happens a lot in the New Testament, this word is used a lot, but this word in this instance is the only instance where Jesus initiates it. It's Jesus who does the approaching. In all the other examples throughout Luke and Acts and through the rest of the New Testament, it's people approaching Jesus. They're wanting something from him. In this instance, what Jesus does is he sees the situation, he's moved with compassion. It's a great Greek word on the, uh, uh, talk, talking, to, uh, it's to do with the kind of how your guts move. Splanknizomai it is, it's a ridiculous word, but it means to do with the moving of the guts. Uh, and, and he's filled with compassion and he approaches the beer where this body is laid out. He initiates it. That's the compassion of Jesus right there. Now, the, the reason I, I point that out is that Jesus' heart attitude in this miracle tells me that the kingdom of heaven is filled up with compassion for people who have gone through some really, really hard stuff in their lives. Are you a person this morning who's gone through some mega hard stuff in your life? Really hard stuff. Like stuff you would never wish on your worst enemy. The miracles of Jesus would say that he would see that in your life 
and that he would want to walk alongside you in it and have compassion about it and to journey with you in it. That's what this compassion of Jesus tells me, that you are not on your own in navigating some of the tough stuff of life. He is right there beside you. You know that illustration that Jesus gives of being, you know, where he says, come and take my yoke upon you? Well, that's like a yoke is a wooden thing for two cattle to be able to pull a a, a plow along. What Jesus is saying is, hey, listen, we're going to plow through your life, and I'm going to be the one half of the yoke, and I'm going to have my arm over your shoulder, and you're going to have your arm over mine, and we're going to do this together. You are not on your own. Amen? You are not by yourself. Furthermore, Jesus presents this young man back to his mom. Like he gives her back to him. And so that tells me in this miracle that we see a family put back together after being split apart through awful, awful circumstances. And that itself tells me that the kingdom of heaven puts families back together. It reunites separated people and it restores relationships that have been cut off. One more thing. When Jesus asks her not to weep, that makes me think straight away of John's vision of heaven in Revelation 21.4, where it promises in God's word that crying and sorrowing and loss will be fully over. Who here would really like it when there's a day when there's no more crying and sorrowing and loss? I would. I find myself pining for that day and not having to navigate the awful situations we find ourselves in in this world. Revelation 21.4 says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief, crying, and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. Miracles are a glimpse into an alternative kingdom of heaven reality. Life, not death. Compassion, not coldness. Family, not isolation. Provision, not destitution. Joy, not weeping. So first, miracles reveal how God really wants things to be uh, in our broken world. Uh, Number two, miracles do not always get the same responses from everyone. Now, why do I say that? Because actually in the story of the widow of Nain, there is a wonderful response from the crowd. It's a great response. And and I I was trying to understand in this story, what is it about this story that is so gorgeous. You know, why does this story leap out like a gem and sparkle in, in, the, in the pages of Luke? What is it that's so unusual about this story? Why is it so just beautiful through and through and through? And I worked out it was to do with something absent that is often present at other miracles. What's absent is religiously motivated objections to Jesus. You can't spot them in this story. Now, let me define what I mean by religiously motivated, because some of you might be confused by that language. Let me talk to you about what I mean by religion, rebellion, and relationship. Um, It's three kinds of postures that we have towards God, and it's probably best summed up in the parable of the prodigal son, actually, from Luke 15. What we see in in that parable is, is three kinds of postures or attitudes to God. The younger son represents rebellion. He represents running off away from the father altogether, having nothing to do with him, uh, and doing his own thing in his own strength. And we know that he comes a cropper, doesn't he? The older son represents religion. And what I mean by religion is being stuffy and dutiful and striving and doing things to try and please the father because there's no realization with the religious that the father loves us or that the father loves them, should I say. So religion is doing things and striving to earn the Father's acceptance. And all religions, except for Christianity, depend upon achievements or striving or works of some kind to get us closer to God. That's, how they, that's the premise of them. But this is ridiculous if you think about it for a moment. Imagine if one of my three lads, uh, you know, George, Simon, or Adam, came to me and sort of said, Hey, Dad, Dad, I've done the dishwasher. Do you love me? I mean, yeah, I mean, I'd be pleased, of course. I'll always take a free dishwasher load. Can I just put that out there? Um, but I, that's, not good. that's not dependent on my love of them. You know, I love them when they were naught and they popped out of their mum's tummy. I love them with a fierce and strong love that started way before anything that they could ever do for me. 
And in fact, I'd be suspicious if they were trying to do things for me in, in order to earn my love because that's all wrong. That's, that's not how God sees his, us as his children. He just loves us. In fact, I think you need to hear that today. God loves you no matter what you do. You cannot earn his love. You cannot get more of his love than he's already giving to you, which is colossal and enormous. Religiously striving people don't get that dynamic at all. They think that you have to do something in order to climb up the acceptance ladder. And when this younger son, the, the, the rebellious one, so not the religious one, we'll come on to him in a minute, but when the rebellious son comes to his senses, he realizes that something's missing. He senses relationship is missing, and also provision a little bit, I think, as well. Um, and he starts to think in terms of rebuilding that connection with his dad. Now, it's not brilliantly formed at the beginning because he, he couches it in the, in the form of servanthood. At least I can go and be a servant in my father's house. Now, that's not the best, but it's the beginnings of trying to reforge the relationship to be right. And when he appears on the horizon, the father runs to him, gives him a hug, gives him a cloak, puts a ring on his finger. They start to celebrate and all the rest of it. And the father insists on being, it being relationship. I love you, and I'm celebrating the fact that you have come back from being lost. And that's the basis on how they begin to connect with each other. The older son, and I want you to notice this, the older son, despite being geographically far nearer, so he's just out in the field next to the, uh, to the housing, he's spiritually much further away, as his horrible and lousy attitude to his younger brother reveals. You know, the older brother in the parable of the prodigal son, when you read the stuff he says about his younger brother, it's horrible. Now, the reason I bring that all in and give you that explanation of re uh, religion, rebellion, relationship is because the miracle of the raising of the widow of Nain's son is highly unusual, not just because there's a resurrection, but because it is so noticeable that there are no religious objectors causing dissent. You haven't got scribes muttering to themselves about incorrect protocol. You haven't got teachers of the law objecting to Jesus touching the touching the, you know, the beer on which the body is laid, which technically would have made Jesus unclean. There's nobody commenting on that. You haven't got Pharisees moaning about which day of the week that this resurrection takes place on. Can I just point out to you that there's a lot of moaning about resurrections or healings that Jesus does when he does them on the Sabbath. Haven't you missed the point if you're complaining about when the healings get done or when the resurrections occur, if, it, if they're going on on the Sabbath? You know, if you're, if you're saying, well, you've done it on the Sabbath, you've kind of missed the point. No, what you get here in Nain is a refreshingly simple reaction from ordinary people uncluttered by the religious objectors. And that is just as it should be. So what we have is something's gone wrong. A man's died too early, leaving his mother, who is also a widow, to fend for herself. That's terrible. That's a tragedy. But look, here comes the amazing power of God in the form of Jesus who performs a resurrection. And the reaction uh, should be and is, wow, look at that. This has suddenly become a place of holy mystery. How did Jesus do that? That man was dead and now he's alive. God must be here and he must be doing something. Now, where maybe not so religious people are very often really open to miracles and their response is worship, the opposite is true as well. Miracles have very little effect on really religious or dutifully stuffy people. You cannot impress a very religious person with a miracle. Sounds shocking, but it's true. Sometimes a miracle will even harden the, the religious person's heart and firms up their resolve to resist God. Now, the reason that miracles are such a challenge to religious people is they completely take away a religious person's much-cherished striving and trying factor. Like if you're trying really hard all the time to get good with God... And then God just does a wonderful miracle. That kind of just knocks out all your trying and kind of hits it for six over the boundary line, doesn't it? It's like, where is your trying then? It's pointless. So if you're someone trying very hard in order to get God to notice you, uh, what you want to see, what, him, what you want him to see is your efforts and good works. So you're not really interested in his efforts and his good works because you're focused on yours. In fact, God's good, work, good works are, not just, are just not as important as yours because you've got a self-agenda going on, all to do with striving and pushing and trying to impress. Now, we don't impress God. He loves us, but we don't impress him. But he can and should certainly impress us, and he does it with his miracles. 
Now, if you think I've gone down a bit of a blind alley here with this observation, let me just remind you from the most extreme example I can think of in the New Testament in which a religious person gets really annoyed by a miracle rather than delighted. And that's the high priest Caiaphas who plots to murder Jesus after he raises Lazarus. No, oh great, Lazarus has been restored to his family. Wow, he's been in the cave for four days and suddenly he's alive again and you know the smell's gone away and he's, look, he's looking and smelling great now and he's back with his friends. None of that, no celebration, no delight and joy at the power of God. No, it's just a really grumpy, well that man's got a ministry that I don't like, let's take it down. You will not, you will not impress the religious with a miracle. The lesson is, if you are genuinely stunned by a miracle, that tells you you're in quite a good place with regards to where you're at with God. Like if a miracle happens here in BCC over the next few weeks, and we all just go, whoa, that tells me the church is healthy. If a miracle happens over here in BCC over the next few weeks, and people go, oh, meh, (laughs) whatever. (laughs) I'm hoping that doesn't happen, by the way, and I'm sure it won't. I'm glaring at you now. Um, That tells me that either you're you're on a religious slippery slope and you've stopped being impressed with God because you're trying to be more impressed with yourself, or maybe your faith has become a bit tired and jaded. The reaction of the crowd at Nain is everything it should be, totally uncluttered by religious establishment garbage and resistance. And that is one of the main reasons why the whole story is such a gem. It took me ages to work out why I like this story so much. And I'm so delighted the Holy Spirit showed me that observation. I couldn't put my finger on it because it's not there in the story. And suddenly it was like, ah, it's an absence of something. I know what it is. It's religious people moaning. And it's just not there. So number one, miracles reveal how God really wants things to be. Number two, um, miracles don't always get the same responses from everyone, but they get a wonderful response in this story. I'm going to ask the worship team just to come back up. Thank you, Sheila and the team. Let's just move on to our last observation for this morning. Sometimes it is helpful to ask ourselves why a gospel writer includes an event in their narrative. Why has Luke put this in here? If you're writing about Jesus, imagine you've got a task, an assignment to write about Jesus, and you've got all sorts of different stories to pick from. Why, why this one? What's the purpose of this? And then behind that, what is the purpose of Jesus doing this miracle? Is there a wider purpose other than just the wonderful compassion and the restoration into a situation that so sorely needs it? In other words, what picture does Jesus want us to receive through this miraculous action? And that's very much the question we're going to ask over the coming weeks. I think, and go with me here, I think there's a little gospel message in this miracle. I really do. The gospel is the good news that Jesus can come and he can turn your life around from being dead and spiritually turned off and disconnected from God. And he can reconnect you to Father God and give you eternal life and a new purpose and a hope and a destiny. And that is good news. That's that's what gospel means. So go with me. Understand the illustration here. The dead man coming out of the gates of the city ready to be buried represents a world dead in sin and completely unable to rescue itself. Being dead, there was nothing that the man or his mum or the community could do anything to change about that. They could not help themselves in any way. They couldn't even ask for help, and they didn't even try. But just as Jesus had com- he appeared and had compassion on this woman and her son, God sends Jesus to us, and he has compassion on us, and he sends us, Jesus, to raise us to new spiritual life in him. Amen? Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through to 7 say this, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ even though we were dead in trespasses. So the picture is from Luke's miracle and what Jesus does is there's a dead situation. It cannot be resolved on its own. It needs an outside agency of divine power to step in and change it around. And that's what Jesus does with this amazing resurrection. Continuing there in Ephesians 2, you are saved by grace. He also raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus. We are spiritually raised in just the same way that this young man got physically raised. And that, I think, is one of the messages of this wonderful story. There was no way this dead man could earn a second chance at life for himself because the chance had gone. 
And that's the same for us. We cannot earn spiritual life with Jesus. He has to come along and give it to us. He has to come along and bless it to us. Now, what we can do is accept what Jesus does for us. We receive it. We sit up. We say thank you. We praise God. We're grateful. We're joyful. We bring him worship and praise for what he's done. And then we can go on to use that new spiritual life that he's given us and do good things with it. If you're a person in here that's had new spiritual life from Jesus, I want to challenge you at the beginning of the year, what are you doing with this incredible gift that you've been given by Jesus? Get out there and use it. You know, I, I kind of sometimes look at my life, and in, in 1997, if you just said to me, oh, yeah, you're going to be a Christian, you're going to be married, you're going to have three sons, you're going to be preaching at a multicultural church in Birmingham in 23 years' time, I'd have gone, get away. No way is that going to happen. But here I am. How incredible is that? How weird. God, thank you for the very strange and wonderful opportunities you've given me in my life that I could never have fabricated or invented in a million years to go and do, and yet here I am doing them. Wow, that's weird. Would you stand with me, BCC? We're going to worship in a minute, and I'm going to ask you to do something. We didn't do this in the first service, and I reflected on it in the gap between the services, and I think we should do this this time. I'm going to ask you a question, and we're going, to, we're going to worship in just a minute, and as the song starts, and as Uri and the team and Sheila lead us in, in music uh, and worship to God, I want, I want you to think about something in your life. If there is a miracle that you have, would love Jesus to do for you, maybe something really long-term, maybe something just in the last few weeks, like a really difficult situation, something that you need God's hand on to turn around, I'm going to ask you to come and stand at the front and ask God it in this space here. Now, no one's going to look at you and judge you and go, oh, they need a miracle. Uh, if they do, they need to come down and join you and help pray with you. And I just say that. There's no judgment in here. If you need a miracle in your life of any kind, small or large, come and ask Jesus for it. Because I think in these next few weeks, there's going to be some miracles popping over the place. I really believe it in my spirit. I don't think Jesus would have asked me to preach a series on this if he wasn't going to come up and show, show good and show power. I really believe that. Hey, we're a Pentecostal church, right? That means the spirit can move. That, Jesus, that means Jesus is alive, right? So come on. So when we worship, step out in faith and let's ask Jesus to do some great stuff in our lives. Amen? Thanks, Sheila. Thanks, Ori. is my firm foundation the rock on which I stand when everything 